Hey Finksters, what's up? It's Adam and in today's video I'm going to be teaching you how to create advanced 3D plots in Matplotlib. So if you don't, if you stumble onto this video by accident and you're not sure how to make basic 3D plots then do check out this link uh, which will take you to my article teaching you all about how to make uh, 3D plots in Matplotlib. Um, so it will cover scatter plots, line plots um, and some other things like rotation, axis label, legend, etc. Uh, but in this particular uh, video, I'll be teaching you how to make two of the most common 3D plots. So that is surface and wireframe wireframe plots. And then also I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step method you can use to create any shape you can imagine as a surface or wireframe. And then also I'll be showing you some little tips and tricks that you can use to modify them as well. So let's dive right into it. In addition to importing matplotlib.pyplot as plt and calling plt.show at the end, uh, as you need to do for all matplotlib plots, uh, to create a 3D plot, you need to import the axis 3D object, uh, initialize your figure and axis 3D object, get some 3D data, and then plot it using axis notation. Now, as you will find out soon, this th step, step three, is the thing that is difficult for surface and wireframe plots. But let's just dive into the most basic example. So standard import, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And then the 3D axis object is in from mpl underscore cool toolkits.mplot3d, import axis 3D. Set up our figure and axis. You can do this a few different ways. This is the way matplotlib recommends. Um, so just uh, plt.figure, fig.add subplot, and uh, we add 111, and this is the key phrase here, projection is 3D, uh, which creates a 3D axis object for you. Um, now, this basic example, I'm just going to use the get test data function um, to cheat a little bit and just create data in one line for our X, Y, and Z. We pass this to ax.plot wireframe, then called plt.show, and if we run it, we see that this is the output we get, which is pretty cool. Um, only a few lines of code and we have got a 3D wireframe plot. Now you can see with the wireframe, you can see through them um, and it doesn't show you the entire surface. But what if you wanted to see an entire surface? Then instead of plot wireframe, you just call plot surface. And there we go. It looks like that. Now note that this is very white and it looks a bit odd. And that's because there are so many lines uh, these white lines here that are on the surface that it looks white instead of blue. But I will show you how to uh, change that uh, later on. So we go back to our wireframe. And if you choose a lower value here of 0 0.1, you can have 0 point, let's say 0.5. Um, and then it looks a bit different. And if we change the surface, you will see uh, it's even more intense, or if we just do change this to 0 0.5, you can see it's it's less intense. And this is a bit of an interesting function, uh, which I will get to I'll get to later. But let's change all of this back. Uh, and I think this was 0 0.1. Cool. All right. So you've just made your first 3D wireframe and surface plots. Don't worry if that was a bit fast. I'll dive into a more detailed example now. Um, note also that I'm using a different style to the uh, defaults and that's because I use Seaborn. So actually when I run my Jupyter notebooks, this command is run automatically. So import Seaborn as SNS and then SNS.set to, to give this this style. Feel free to download Seaborn and do that as well. I think it looks very nice. So let's dive into a more detailed example. The four steps you need to create an advanced 3D plot are the same as those needed to create basic ones. So if you don't know those, please do check out this article. And <clears throat> matplotlib has the helper function get test data, um, which will generate some data for you. So it accepts a float, any float you want, but for best uh, results, choose a value between zero and one. Uh, the larger values actually give less detailed plots. But to be honest, it's not the most, it's not the best way to learn 3D plots, I don't think. Um, so I'm going to teach you that now. So the best way to do it is to create your own custom plots. So let's think about the end goal we have. We want to have three NumPy arrays, X, Y, and Z, all capitals, which will pass then to ax.plot wireframe or ax.plot surface. Um, as we do here, we have our X, Y, and Z, and we just pass it there. 
and we're going to call plt.show. But in order to get these arrays x, y, and z, we have to follow these four steps. So one, we need to define the x-axis and y-axis limits. Two, we need to create a grid of x, y points to get our capital x and y. Then we need to define a z function. We apply that z function to x and y. Whoa. And then we get z. So what does that all mean? In matplotlib, the z-axis is vertical by default. So this axis here is the z-axis. So we can see here, uh, so this is x, I believe, and this is y. And you can see then that the xy plane is this flat plane here on the bottom. And we can see that for this particular graph, x is defined between 0, is between minus 30 and 30, and y is also between minus 30 and 30, and z is between minus 80 and 100. So what we want is we are creating this axis. So we need to have the x values all ranging from minus 30 to 30, and then we need these y values as well. Uh, so the first step in order to create these, these axis objects is we want to define our, the limits for our x and y axis. So for this, uh, an easy way to do that is using the mp.linspace function. Uh, I have an article about that as well uh, if, you, if you want to learn how to use that. But in short, it accepts uh, three, there are three most important arguments. So the first one um, is the lower limit. The second one is the upper limit. And num is tells you how many values uh, will be in this list. So what it does, it creates, sorry, an array of values. So this one here, x equals mp.linspace minus five, five, numbers 100. It creates a, an array um, containing the numbers from minus five to five, and it's a hundred numbers, and each of them are equally spaced out. So here we've defined x between minus five and five, and, five, and y between minus two and two. We've given x 100 and y 70, and you'll, you'll see why that is important in a minute. So we will run that. And if we see, we do type x, we get that it's an array. And if we uh, print x, we see it goes from minus five here all the way to five there. And the difference between all these numbers is the exact same. Cool. Okay, so now the xy plane is a 2D object. And what we, what we want is, we can see that on a surface and even for a wireframe, every single point on the xy plane has a corresponding z value. So we need to, for x is zero, we need to have a value for when y is minus 30, when, my, when y is minus 20, when my, y is minus 10, when y is zero, and so on, but for absolutely every single number. So to save us writing all that out, um, uh, NumPy has this great function, mp.meshgrid. All you do is you pass your x and y limits, and it gives you x and y. So I've noticed I've capitalized them there. That's because uh, if we inspect them, we see that they're both NumPy arrays, and we see that they're both of shape, they have the same shape, so 70, 100. So these are now, we've taken our 1D arrays, X and Y, and we've changed them into capital X and Y, which are now 2D arrays. Um, and the shape of them is 70, 100. Uh, so 70 is the number of rows, and 100 is the number of columns. And if you remember up here, we've set X to have 100. Um, so X can be thought of as the width or the number of columns. And then Y can be thought of as the number of rows or the height. So it makes sense that these have this size. So now what we need to do is we have our all the X, Y points we need. Um, note that there are infinitely many points on this grid, this X, Y plane. So we just need enough to trick humans or that it looks good enough for, uh, so, it, so it, it looks like a surface basically. Uh, so a good number is about 50, I would say. Uh, anything over 50 for, for these Linspace ones works well. Uh, so in order to, so we can see that every X, Y point, it has this Z value and that is how, and this is all defined by something I call a Z function. So this takes two arguments, X and Y, and returns a single value, and that will be the different height. So we can see here for, for some um, values, let's say uh, plus 30 and minus 30, it gives the same value, it gives about zero, and then we see over here it gives about zero as well. 
but the z value for these, let's say x is 20 and y is 10, is much higher, around 80. So um, we can define it as anything you want to be. Often, oh wait, am I gonna sneeze? No, I'm good. Often um, you'll see sine and cos in these functions a lot. And that's just because they are they create repeating cyclical patterns and they look quite interesting when plotted in 3D. Um, and they usually combine both X and Y, but they don't have to. Um, it just makes sense for them for them to do so. So all we do is just use the standard define um, Z funk X, Y, MP dot sign. And then inside that, we're going to do MP cos X plus Y. And we'll just see what that looks like. I just played around with loads of different ones. And I think this one looks quite cool. And then in order to get our capital Z uh, variable, we just apply that to X and Y together. And thanks to NumPy broadcasting, it applies this function Z to every single X, Y pair almost instantly. So if we run this now, you'll see it executed in four milliseconds. So hardly any time at all. So this is one reason why using built-in NumPy functions is really important um, and saves you from having to write a really wildly inefficient for loop. So and we'll check the shape of X and Y and, uh, and the type, and we'll see that the type of Z is also a NumPy array, and it's also the same shape, 7100. Awesome. So now that we have all the data, the hard bit is out of the way. And all you have to do is the standard plotting. So we'll set up our figure and axis. We'll, and then I'm just copying and pasting the code that we've just walked through here. So set up our uh, X and Y axis limits, create the X, Y plane, define the Z function. I just put it all on one line here just to save space. It's not technically super Pythonic, but I think it's fine for this case. And then create our Z 2D array. And then like we like we wanted ax dot plot wireframe x y z and I'm just going to use the set method to set the x label y label and z label so you can see which axis is which call plt dot show and here we go uh, so you see this is the x axis this is the y and this is the z it has cut it off a little bit there but this is our wireframe I think this looks really really cool I'll be honest. Um, this cool, this cool shape, you can see it's going up here, it's going down there. Very, very interesting. And this is this is why 3D plotting is really, is really helpful. I really recommend you play around with Z functions. So we can just define this to be something else. So let's say, um, let's say if we just do X squared, for example, plus Y, you'll see, whoa, that looks pretty weird. <laughs> or if we do MP, dot log x so this will be odd because you can't because uh, x goes from minus five to five you can't log a minus number uh, so you see it stops here at x is zero but loads and loads of different interesting shapes uh, so i recommend you you play around with them um because uh, it's just it's just good fun so now i'll create three different z functions with the same x and y uh just so you can see different ones that i've already just shown you so this is just setting up the figure and axis in one, in one line using plt.subplots. And I discussed this in my uh, the first article here, how to do that. Uh, but you can do subplot keyword equals dict, projection is 3D. This gets passed, passed to add subplot. And then I'm going to set the fig size to have an aspect ratio of a third. So that means it's, uh, it's three times as wide as it is long. And then I'm just going to create three kind of random Z functions, um, all a combo of exponential, cars, log, sign. And then we'll pack these into a list and then give them all names, which are just the same as this. And in order to plot them, uh, I'm going to use a for loop, for, so for Z array, uh, Z name axis in zipping them all together. And I'm going to plot the wireframe, X, Y, and then Z array. Um, and then the title will be the same as the name. We'll plot it and you'll see all these pretty cool functions um ones that you wouldn't really be able to come up with i don't think in your head and this is the power of 3d plotting and i really hope they've encouraged you to create some of your own so that's it that is all you need to know to create any service or wireframe plot with your data to be honest to, to change it to um 
a surface, all you need to do is just change wireframe to surface. And then it works like this. But there's an issue. Why is it all white? It looks very strange. Let's solve that problem right now. Cool. There we go. So in order to plot a wireframe, you just call ax.plot wireframe, x, y, z. Oh, yeah. So the pretty much surface and wireframes are the same. It's just that for wireframe plots, you see the, these gaps between them aren't filled in. But for surface plots, they are filled in. So one thing you can do is change how many lines are in each plot. So I'll show you how to do that right now. So those lines are controlled by the four, um, four different arguments. Uh, so R stride, C stride, or R count and C count. And the R and C stand for row and column respectively. And the difference between them is similar to MPA range and MP lint space. If you're not sure how to use those functions, check out uh, the articles on Finkster. So the stride argument defaults to one and it is the step size between each sampled point because these plots just take a sample of the data. They don't plot all of it. That's where those, those lines, those wires in the wireframe plot come from. So a stride of one, uh, but of course, if you want to, you can plot every single point. So a stride of one means every single value is chosen and a stride of 10 means that every 10th value is chosen. So in that way, it's similar to MPA range in where you select the step size. So a larger value uh, stride means that fewer values are chosen. So your plot renders faster, but is also less detailed. Uh, on the flip side, the count arguments default to 50 and they set the number of equally spaced rows slash columns sampled. So if you have a count of one, it means you use one row slash column and a count of 100 means you use 100 rows slash columns. So in that way, it's similar to MP dot lint space, which you've seen above, where you select the total val total number of values with the num keyword argument. So a larger count means more values are chosen. And so your plot renders slower and is more detailed. The matplotlib docs recommend using the count arguments. However, you can use both and it doesn't look like the stride arguments will be depre depreciated. Note though that you cannot use both count and stride. If you try to do so, it is a value error. So just pick one you're happy with or just play around with both. Um, and if you're not sure, I would say use count uh, just because that's what matplotlib recommends. Oh, and finally, if you set either of them to zero, uh, you do not sample data along that axis. So then it doesn't give you a 3D line. It gives you a 3D line plot rather than a wireframe plot because you've only sampled. It's only a 1D thing then. So let's go over the differences. So I will be making a lot of plots that look like this. So using fig axis, plt.subplots, creating, actually I'll be using these X, Y things, um, X, Y, and Z, um, uh, arrays a lot, uh, but I will then be using a very, I will using be this for loop pattern a lot. So for stride access, but I'll be changing strides and stuff to colors and whatever, uh, but you'll be seeing this uh, zip x.plot wireframe and then x.set title. Uh, very common. I won't be going over it every single time just because, just to save time because it's they're all very, very similar. <laughs> So here I've, I will just highlight the most important things. So the most important things is I'm using the same uh, X, Y, and Z arrays as before. Um, and I'm setting uh, different strides, one, five, and 10, plotting them. And you'll see that stride of one selects absolutely everything. Stride of five selects a, a bit less and a stride of 10 selects even less. And now I'm gonna do the exact same thing but we're going to set counts to different values. So R count and C count, both the same. And we'll see that a count of five uh, gives you a much less detailed plot than count equals 20. And then the default count equals 50. Awesome. Okay, so surfaces. To make a surface plot, as you've already shown, as you've already seen, call ax.plot surface xyz. Um, and these can all be modified through count as well. So again, all this code here is the same. We're just setting the count to 520 or 50. And you'll see that here, this is the default. It's very white because the lines are all white. But as we decrease the count, um, we can see more and more of it is uh, blue. But um, what if we wanted, one issue with having a low count is that our plots are actually less detailed because they've sampled less of the data. So this is actually a better representation of it than count equals five because it might miss some of it. Um, 
so how can we how can we fix that how can we actually have a nice blue plot without uh, missing too much of the data so we can do this by setting the line width of these lines um, to a smaller value either not such as 0.1 or 0 uh, with the line width or LW argument so here just using the same uh, same code as before, but just plotting one surface and setting the line width equals zero. And you can see now, although the lines are there and they're still faint, uh, everything is blue and it's uh, it's much nicer to see everything. So that's cool. Uh, one other thing you can do if you still don't like these little white lines is you can set the this keyword argument anti-aliased <laughs> anti -aliased equals false. And this is what it looks like. So now we've set in our plot surface called line width and anti aliased equals false and you can't see any of the white lines so what it actually does it's a concept used in image smoothing and it removes noise from the data and smooths out the images so by turning it off the surface is less smooth and you can't see the lines as easily basically okay so now we know how to plot surface plots and wireframe plots let's look at uh, one thing that is really important for especially surface plots C map. Some would argue that this is the most important argument um, because it sets the whoopsie daisy because it sets the color map. So when you look at surface plot from different angles, having a color map helps you understand which parts of the surface are where. We'll look at some rotations later, but imagine if you were looking at this not side on but top down. Um, you wouldn't know that this was lower down than this point, for example, because it's all the same color. So a really helpful thing to do is this. So we set up our figure and axis, plot surface, set the line width to a low value, and pass C map equals, and then any of the uh, color maps in matplotlib. So they have loads of them. Um, this article here uh, goes through them all. Uh, you can pass any of these in. I recommend playing around with them because it is it's quite nice seeing different ones, and different colors can have a different effect. So. Uh, I also discussed uh, some examples as well in my matplotlib imshow article. Check that out as well. Uh, so now I'll just make this same plot by using three different color maps to see how uh, color can help and even massively hinder your plots. So here we go. This is copper. Um, again, using the same uh, code structure, but just swapping out the C map each time. This is cool warm. So you can see, so for copper, black is low values and orange is at high values. For cool warm, blue is low values, white is middle values and red is high values. And then for jet, oh God, cra craziness. So <laughs> I do not recommend you ever use jet. I'm only using this as an example of why you should not use it because it's so difficult to tell or remember which is high, which is low, um, is green, this in between green and blue or in between yellow and red and, and all this. It's, it's very difficult. Um, it can look nice on the eyes a little bit, but it's not useful to do any scientific analysis, unfortunately. Um, so I think copper works quite nicely if you want to look at if you want to highlight two different areas, so we want to highlight low and high areas. Cool warm is quite nice if you want to highlight three areas. So if you specifically want to highlight uh, low, middle and high areas. And jet is not really useful for anything, <laughs> apart from examples telling you never to use it. Um, if you're interested in colors, I found this really interesting, this non-technical paper. Uh, basically defines, oh, we'll see how long it takes to load, but it effectively defines this cool warm color map and says that this it gives a strong argument for why this should be the default for, for most uh, for most plots. It doesn't look like it's going to load. Okay, let's now look at how the, uh, the stride and count arguments can impact your color, the color of your plots. So, oh, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> oh, bless me. So here we've set the C map to copper for all of them. We've set the line width to zero um, in this call, and we've modified the count. As you can see, the R count and C count are this 520 and 50. And you can see that for high counts, the uh, the difference between colors is quite nice. Uh, it's very smooth. 
and if you get if you if you have a low account you'll see that it's still relatively smooth but you can see how it, they change on each um, on each row and column that's sampled and if you have a very low count you'll see that they're very distinct bands um, and so there's there isn't this idea really of a smooth change at all uh, so that's just something to keep in mind using a large account will give you a more accurate representation and the colors will also be a bit more uh, a bit more nuanced they won't be as almost discreet as these colors are um, of course, if you have colors, you will always, you'll also want to add a color bar. So to do that, very, very simple. Um, so all you do is you just save the output of ax.plotSurface in a variable such as surf and pass that variable to plt.colorbar. Um, so here's an example of doing that. So what have we done here? So this is setting up the figure and axis. These are our C maps. Um, we iterate over them. We save the plot surface. Um, function call in surf and then we pass that to fig.colorbar uh, and axe equals axe because uh, a color bar is a figure method not an axis method so you have to state where you want it to be drawn and then we'll give it a title using an f string uh, for each color map so we can see here um, that they're placed next to each one and it takes up a bit of space so if you wanted to make your figures uh, a bit bigger you, you definitely could um, cool so that is how to add color bars. Um, another thing that I spoke about before is rotating plots. So we've only looked at them all from this angle so far, but what if you wanted to look at them from a different angle? One thing you could do is run matplotlib notebook, this magic command in your Jupyter notebooks, and they will all be rendered as interactive plots. However, if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, and you're using matplotlib inline, then you will have to rotate your plots using code. So uh, there are two attributes to, that control the rotation of a 3D plot, ax.elev, which stands for elevation, and ax.azim, which stands for azimuth. So they are the elevation and azimuth angles of the plot, respectively. Um, so the elevation is the angle above the xy plane. So that's this plane here. And the azimuth, don't worry, I haven't heard of it before either, is the counterclockwise rotation about the z-axis. Um, note that they're properties of the axis 3D object. Um, so you can easily create, if you have multiple subplots, for example, you can create um, uh, different, each axis can have a completely different rotation. So let's go, let's first off find out what the default values are. So all we have to do is set up a fig and axis, a uh, 3D one using protection as 3D. And then using an F string, I'm gonna do the default elevation angle is ax.elev, and then the same for azimuth angle, ax.azim. And we see that it's 30 and then minus 60. So 30 above the XY plane, and then minus 60 is the counterclockwise rotation. So it means actually 60 degrees clockwise rotation. <laughs> So um, we, you can set them to any float you want. Remember that if you, uh, like it, it resets every 360 degrees. So if you have, but you can pass in a thousand, you can pass in 2000, whatever it will just spin. But of course it can only, it doesn't matter if it spins two or three times. Uh, so really any number between zero and 360 makes sense or even zero and minus 360, uh, minus 360 and 360 if you wanna, um, be specific about uh, negative or, or positive rotation. So one way you can do it is just reassign ax.asm and ax.elev attributes. So let's look at that now. We'll just set up the same figure and axis as usual, uh, set the axis labels, and then I'm gonna set the asim and elev both to zero. And you'll see now that the y axis is at the front, as uh, z axis on the left and x axis is on the right hand side so that's what it looks like if it's at zero um, and you can see this is the same plot as before um, we've got the the orange up at the top and the black down at the bottom um, the other way you can do it is using the ax.view init method uh, so that takes two two keyword arguments so this code is all the same as above uh, and just to assign the rotation angles we just call ax.view init um, 
So view init um, will stands for view initialization. And so that will be how you want the uh, your access to be initialized, how you want it to be created. Um, so you initialize the view uh, by setting, we're going to set the elevation to zero and the azimuth to zero as well. Um, and again, we'll see that this is the same plot as before. Um, if you want to change just one of the angles, uh, you can. Of course, you can just um, assign one of them to zero, or you can just pass one of the keyword arguments as well. So in this example, this code is all the same. And then we're going to set the elevation to 90 degrees. AX.view in it, elev is 90. And we see that now we're looking at the plot from the top. So it's hard. So this is why color maps are really important. We can see that these bits here are higher up because they're lighter colors. And we can see these bits here are darker um, because it's darker colors. And we can see here as well that um, the the plot increases in size here. Um, and you can only, we can only tell that because we've applied the color map. If we do not have a color map, let's remove this. We'll see that it's just blue. And so we can kind of tell a little bit, um, but it's way, 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 way easier um, if we just have a nice color map. There we go, nice. So, that's it. That is all. That is what you need to know to create ed the two most critical 3D plots, wireframes and surface plots. These are things that will take your data analysis, your data visualizations to the next level. You've learned how to create custom 3D plot data sets using mp.linspace and mp.meshgrid, combining them with Z functions. I would say I haven't found actually a tutorial online teaching that. Um, I had to figure that out myself. So you knowing how to do that is really, really, really advanced. Um, so you should be proud of yourself now. And of course, you can change the uh, accuracy of your surface and wireframe plots by modifying the count and stride keyword arguments, though I recommend using the count ones as does matplotlib. Uh, you can make surface plots of any color and color map, and you can even modify them so that the lines don't take over the plot as they do if you set the count uh, too high and uh, do not modify the line width accordingly. Um, finally, you can rotate your plots using the ax.azim or ax.elev attributes, um, passing in a float of your choice, or even using the ax.viewinit method to do the same thing, to rotate them however you want, of course, though, if you want to create interactive plots, make sure you run matplotlib notebook instead of matplotlib in line uh, in your Jupyter notebooks. So congratulations on mastering these plots. Um, there are other advanced plots as well, which you can check out, such as the contour, trisurface, pardon me, and quiver plots. Uh, they will all be really easy for you to create now because you've learned all the essential high-level skills you need to create plots like that. I would say surface and wireframes are a bit more common, but depending on why you're learning Python and how you will be using it in real life, um, you may need to learn those plots as well. Um, I do recommend checking out the matplotlib docs as they have um, quick little tutorials on how to create each one. So thank you so much for watching. If you wish you could be a, be a programmer full time, but you don't know how to start, I have got a recommendation for you. This is how I felt a few months ago now. Um, and then I stumbled across an article on Finkster. Um, and oh, what was it? I can't, it was teaching me how to use the star operator of all things. And I thought, wow, this is absolutely incredible. I'm loving Python. I'm loving programming, but I don't know how to actually make money online doing it. And then I found this webinar um, that, that Chris, the creator of uh, Finkster, uh, is giving. And it teaches you exactly how to become a freelancer, go from earning $0 a month to over $4,000 per month with the world's only Python freelancer course. So it's guaranteed to earn at least $20 an hour in 60 days or you will get your money back. Um, it's an absolutely amazing course. Here's Chris, the founder of Finkster, talking about it. Here's me. Oh, 
him and I wanted to do a quick... There I am talking about it, um, showing you how I earn $50 an hour within two months, more than doubling the guarantee. I actually love this course so much that I'm still making videos for Finkster because I think it's an absolutely incredible site. But also, I even gave two reviews. I gave a month four update um, showing how I'm earning more than $5,000 a month uh, as a freelancer on Upwork. So I cannot recommend this enough. It's a free one-hour webinar uh, teaching you how to become a Python freelancer online. I'm currently, well, I'm actually in Bulgaria right now. Um, trapped here, of course, because of coronavirus. But I was snowboarding and having fun uh, before the coronavirus happened. Um, so if you're not making six figures a year with Python, uh, you will definitely learn something from this webinar. They're proven, no BS methods that will get you results fast. So it won't be online forever. I recommend you click the link below, sign up uh, before the seats fill up and learn how to become a Python freelancer guaranteed. So thank you so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any comments or queries, post them uh, below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you so much and I will see you in the next one.